Without further ado, so my name's Adam Alexander. I, I call myself a seed detective. I'm, um, I was born and raised on the land. I've been growing ever since I was a kid. Um, and at the moment, I'm a director of Garden Organic. I'm a seed guardian for the Heritage Seed Library. And I have been building a collection of rare and endangered um, vegetables from all over the world for a number of years and I'll tell you about that in a minute but I wanted uh, first just to briefly talk about this photograph because to me it it is it symbolizes what so many of us have lost and this young lady is a member of the Hmong tribe in Laos and uh, she lives on the uh, she lives on the Mekong River and as you can see, she is tending the highest raised bed in the world. And the reason why she's doing that and looking after her spring onions and uh, what the other little things that she's growing on her raised bed is because if she didn't, the pigs, the ducks, the dogs and everything else that are roaming free in her village would be eating them. But the important thing is that she is she is completely imbued with the culture, not only her own culture as a, as a Hmong, but also her food culture. And that is something that, as I said, we've lost, and I'm very, my work is all about how do we reconnect with our food culture and um, understand and learn yeah. ab about the experiences of others. It really all started for me about 35 years ago. I'm a filmmaker by, by trade, or I was by profession, and I was in, found myself in, of all places, Donetsk in the Ukraine, and I was making a TV series actually directed by a, an extremely well-known and highly skilled Bristol director, Colin Thomas. And in the dying days of the Soviet Union, when we were there filming, it was my responsibility as the producer. I had to keep the crew fed and motivated. And Colin is a vegetarian. And being a vegetarian in what was still then the Soviet Union was guaranteed that you were going to have a very, very limited and poor diet. And so it was upon me to try and enrich his diet in some way. And what one did was, you couldn't, the shops were empty, but the markets had food in them. And the sort of people that were selling food in the markets were um, mostly older women who were trying to augment their e meager um, pensions, the few rubles they had, by selling the fruits and vegetables that they had growing in their gardens. And I went into the main market in Donetsk. Um, and there I met somebody who was to become an archetype for me. And she was this little old lady, this babushka. And she had a number of things growing, including this pepper. And I, you know, I'd, been, I'd saved a few seeds in my time, runner beans mostly, but I was tending to be like most growers and buying my seed from commercial sources. And I didn't really think anything about this pepper. I thought, well, Colin will like it, and it's a classic part of Eastern European and um, food culture. Uh, you know, the pepper grows and is eaten everywhere, and there's probably as many recipes for stuffing a pepper as there are Ukrainian babushkas um, cooking them. And I took this pepper back to the hotel and into the kitchen, and I thought, I better just see what it's like. And I sliced it open and took a bite, and it was a, a wow moment for me. And I, I, it's just the most delicious sweet pepper I've ever eaten. To this day, there is no other, if I could only grow one pepper, it would be that one. And it's thick fleshed, and it was very fruity, and a lovely complex flavor, and a lovely little bit of heat in it from the membrane on the inside of the pepper. And, uh, Colin and the crew were very happy, and I thought, I wonder if I save some seeds from these and bring them back to my garden, whether I'll be able to grow it. 
and I've been growing it ever since. And one of the, at the time that I was there, I never thought that I would now be growing this pepper for seed to give to displaced Ukrainians to uh, have a, a memory, if you like, a reminder of home. Um, but it, it was the thing that started my journey of collecting particularly the, the vegetables that mattered to the people around the world that I was meeting and that I was making films about or who I was finding on my holidays. And now I have a library of about 500 varieties and many of them are actually ones that I hope that I'm growing out for the Heritage Seed Library, but there are also varieties that people have sent me, um, and a number that I've found in my travels trying to understand what indigenous food culture is all about and um, how precarious or otherwise those food cultures can be. And I've written a book which explores 14 vegetables that I have a, that mean a lot to me and are part of my own personal journey over the last 35 years. And um, I just wanted to give you a flavour this afternoon of an, a few of those vegetables that I've written about and why they are important and what they tell us, not only about the fragility of the genetic diversity of edible crops, but also how they matter to people. And I wanted to take you to, I was in Rajasthan, it was um, 2019, and I had gone to Rajasthan, uh, it's, you know, I wanted, I hadn't been to India for a number of years, Rajasthan is the, probably the most colourful state in India, I certainly think it is, and it has this incredible history, but it also has an extraordinary food diversity. And it's very, and the Rajasthanis are very, very proud of their food. If you go into a market anywhere in Rajasthan, actually the only fruits and vegetables people want to buy are either those that have been foraged in the deserts because we're in a hyper-arid region, part of, part of India, or what they call desi, local varieties. They're really not interested in eating anything that comes from out of state. And I had been doing some research and had been at the Agricultural Research Centre in a city called Bikaner, um, discussing the, trying to understand what the kind of challenges were to maintain this diversity. And there's a very, very famous chilli that's actually eaten all over India, the Matanya chilli, which was grown in the Matanya region in the southern part of Rajasthan. And I, the, the conversation amongst the agronomists and the botanists that I was uh, talking to was that this particular chili had been lost. And it had been lost, its uniqueness and its distinctiveness actually as a land race, Capsicum annuum, uh, was because farmers were growing uh, modern cultivars and the, the capsicums would cross pollinate. And so what was happening was that over the years, the Matania chilies were essentially changing their morphology and their, 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 their phenotype their, and their flavors and all the rest of it was changing because they were essentially crossing. And I could completely understand why farmers were doing this because they need to make a living and they need to feed their families. But the consequence of their actions of actually not maintaining the genetic diversity of their own land races was that they lost them. And so everybody was generally moaning about, oh, you can't get a Matania chili anymore. And I've found plenty of vegetables around the world by knowing where to look. And so I had a wonderful driver who was a Rajput farmer himself, so he completely understood this, and, um, and had, was mourning the loss of the Matania chili. I haven't eaten one for years, you can't get them anymore. I said, we're going to the Matania region get in the back of a jeep, and let's go and see what we can find. And so we ended up driving across this bumpy, sort of semi-arid region, and came. I thought, if we're going to find a land race that remains 
in a sense, true to type. You have to get away from civilization, other farms, other foreign chilies. And so there we were, this beautiful farm with its gorgeous Rajasthani sheep producing the most delicious yogurt I've ever eaten. It was just oh, fantastic. And there in her immaculate yard was Mrs. Davy. And she invited us in and she wanted to give us some lovely, um, uh, some of her sorghum chapatis and her own millet curry and lovely food and yogurt, of course. And we started talking about the Matanya chili. And I noticed a pile of chilies um, on, in her yard. And I, I looked at Narendra and I said, are you thinking what I'm thinking? And uh, he said, sure. And uh, at the back of her yard, there was just this little collection of chilies growing. And um, I said to uh, Mrs. Debbie, tell me about this. You know, have you been growing for long? She said, of course, I've been growing. I, you know, I, I grow all the, the, the vegetables around, around the homestead, as did my mother before me, my grandmother before me. And I, so I knew that, that immediately this was a genuine uh, heirloom, but actually really a land race of a particular type of chili. And then we asked if we could try one. And uh, she said, of course. And she handed us uh, a chili from this uh, pile that was on the floor. And uh, we bit into it. And Narendra burst into tears. And he said, I haven't tasted this for, I think it was 14 or 15 years. He said, this is the Matanya chili, as it should be. And um, it's wonderful. It's, it's quite spicy. It's not hugely, you know, you don't measure your manhood or your womanhood by how much heat you get out of that chili. But what you get is something that has the most or fabulous organoleptic qualities. It's fruity. It's subtle. It's magnificent. And that's why the Rajasthanis and a lot of other people in India liked to use it in their, in their cuisine. And, um, of course, she'd been saving the seeds for generations. And could we have some seeds? Of course we could have some seeds. And she gave us some seeds. And I needed to then figure out whether it really was what we thought it was. So anyway, I took some seeds back to, to, um, to Bikaner and kind of thought to myself, why hasn't one of those botanists got off their backsides and out of their lab and into the field and gone looking? Because it wasn't that difficult to find it. Anyway, I also, of course, brought seed home. Um, don't tell anybody. Uh, and I, one of the great things about traveling and trying to find different varieties of vegetables is, you know, you go to Rajasthan and it's January. And actually, it's like a beautiful early summer's day here in Bristol. Uh, you know, with the daytime temperatures maybe I don't know, 22, 23. But you get late frosts. And that's what's really interesting for me is that you have local varieties that are adapted to a climate growing in the dry season in their winter, which actually not that different to growing here. A lot drier, of course. And I, I you know, these chilies, very, very happy growing in my greenhouse at home. And the other interesting thing about them is they're very genetically diverse. They're not uniform. They're not like the chili that you buy in the supermarket aisles of Tesco's or Sainsbury's or whatever, um, which is part of things that have to be distinct, uniform, and stable. If those of you who were here, if the previous speaker will understand about UPOV the idea that you need to have things that are homogeneous rather than heterogeneous, which is what this chili is. And to sort of conclude the story about Matanya chili, so I grow it, I, I, I save seeds, I share seeds with people, and then I was reading an article in The Observer uh, a few weeks ago, and the Matanya chili is back on the menu of the smartest restaurants in Jaipur. And it sort of makes you realize how you can 
something that can be, it's not lost, but it hasn't been found. And when it is found, and suddenly it comes back into the community, people start growing it, and they're very happy uh, and delighted to have it. And so that's an example for me of how this fragility of something that, where people have a visceral relationship with what they grow and what they eat. And so for me, trying to encourage people to save their own seeds, to think of themselves in a sense as plant breeders in their own right, developing varieties that are well locally adapted, there's plenty of them being grown around here, um, and that then are part of your sense of identity. I've spent a lot of time in some fairly dodgy places. Um, one of them was, I was in Syria at the start of the Civil War, and again, I was there by accident more than anything. I was trying to, I, again, it's a country that has this unbelievable history. Um, you know, Damascus is the, um, is the oldest continuously inhabited city in the world, four and a half thousand years. They've been living in that part of the world for a very, very long time. And it also was the breadbasket of the Middle East. Syria is, of all the countries that I've traveled in the Middle East, it is the most amazing because the diversity of foods is incredible. The most delicious um, uh, pistachios, the most de de delicious pomegranates, peaches. I mean, just incredible what they're growing, plus lots and lots of local varieties. And I was, I found myself in, of all places, Palmyra, and it was, it was a, this is a civil war going on. It's great to go to a country when there's conflict because there are no tourists. You have the place to yourself. And, um, and I was in this amazing city, and there was a little cafe near the entrance to the old Roman city. And uh, wherever you traveled in Syria, you would actually lots of places in the Middle East. You'd go into a restaurant, particularly on the time you have a big buffet, and went into this little cafe, and there was this lovely, big bowl of salad. And it was a salad of fava beans, and other things, it wasn't just fava beans, there was all sorts of things in there, but there were these giant fava beans, the biggest I'd ever seen, and they were lovely, and they weren't flowery, they were, had a, they were just, oh, they tasted properly of what a fava bean should taste like. And I went and talked to the chef and asked him where they'd come from. And he said, well, I, I grow them. And um, if you look at that photograph, you'll see that there's an oasis. You know, you're in the middle of the Syrian desert, and there's plenty of opportunities to grow stuff. And he had been growing this fava bean, and as had his family, they were all farmers. It had been grown in Palmyra for generations. And what interested me particularly about it was that the fava bean was domesticated, uh, we think, I don't know, around about 10,000, 8 to 10,000 years ago. Actually, the oldest archaeological evidence of fava beans is in Israel, and that's about 7,500 years old. But in Syria, the oldest um, excavations, archaeological excavations of fava beans was in a little village that was north of Palmyra and it was being excavated in the 70s when Lake Assad was being built and before the place was inundated um, by the water rising in the lake they found these beans which were about five and a half thousand years old and that was metaphorically just up the road about 150 kilometers north of Palmyra not so far and you have to think, back then, when that bean was being grown, we were in, the world was a very different place. That wasn't a desert. This was a verdant, diverse land where the home of cereals, it's, it's where Emma wheat came from, it's where you got chickpeas and, I mean, the great founder crops that are the foundations of our diet today came from that part of the world. And I wanted, I was really keen to see how it was growing and what was different about it. And at the time, the war had not come to Palmyra, and so I didn't think, I was doing it just for myself, for curiosity. And this, the chef, gave me some 
beans to take home, and I brought them home, and I grew them in my garden. And what's really interesting about this bean is that it's, for those of you who know, fava beans, we have the broad, the broad bean you grow on your allotment in your garden, it's quite long, it has lots of beans in it, and we tend to eat them as a shelled bean. But the field bean, which is what farmers are tending to grow for fodder, is, is, it is allowed to dry and the beans are then used as a protein crop for animal feed or exported to Egypt, interestingly enough, um, uh, to, to be dried and turned into split farmers that are then returned to some swanky um, uh, whole food uh, 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 shop in Bristol to be sold at a great price. They've almost certainly been grown in East Anglia. They certainly haven't been grown in North Africa. But the field bean is a short bean. And uh, the, the beans inside are small. So the, probably the most famous example of that is the martok bean, which comes from martok just south of here. It's been grown in this country for hundreds and hundreds of years. And this bean was different. And it was a bean that was short, and it had three or four really big beans, the size of my thumb, bigger. And that really told me a story, which was that for literally thousands of years, the farmers in that region had been selecting from the diversity of fava beans that were growing rampantly all over that part of the world for something that had particular qualities they wanted. They weren't interested in more beans in the pod. They just wanted bigger beans in the pod and delicious ones mm -hmm. because that's the other key driver for the diversity of foods that we have had in the past and which we're losing at a shocking rate at the moment. Why do these people grow this stuff? Because it's nutritious and it's delicious and it's also part of their identity. And the great thing about this bean is that it was when I brought it back in 2012, I was able to, at that, at that point, the Syrian, um, displaced Syrians were starting to, less so in the UK, we're always rather late to the table for inviting uh, displaced people into our country. But there were other places, Canada in particular, that had quite a large group of, of Syrian refugees already there in 2012. And so I was able to send seeds from this particular fava bean to Canada for Syrian refugees to start growing themselves for the same reason, to be able to remind them of home, to be reconnect them with their food culture. And if you go to, if, not that any of us are ever going to go back there anytime soon, but it's really interesting in Syria because in the springtime, I was there in May, and the, you go through the streets of Damascus or Aleppo, and there are young boys with big carts piled high with fava beans. But they're a different one to this. They're one that they eat whole, like a French bean, which again, now very cool to eat a whole fava bean. They've been doing it in Syria probably for three or four thousand years. One of the things that I'm very, very interested in telling the stories about is the ingenuity of these, our forebears, these Neolithic farmers who were the first people to domesticate crops, just like that father bean before me, before me. So, and I, to me, the, the, the greatest example of this, this ingenuity, actually was in South America. So in my book, I write about seven plants that come from the east of my garden, which is essentially the old world, the Fertile Crescent, and Southern Asia. And then seven from the new world, which is Mesoamerica, Mexico, and parts of Central America, and the northern part of South America, which has an unbelievable diversity of crops. If you think about what you eat every day, where it originally came from, you know, Chilies, tomatoes, sure, we, we know about that. Avocados, uh, cocoa, I mean, the, the list is endless. Squash, and yo, on and on and on, potatoes, obviously. And the really interesting thing about maize is that for, for, up until the middle of the 1950s, scientists, botanists, 
plant geneticists were working on the assumption that these Neolithic farmers and early farmers, indigenous farmers in, in Mesoamerica, four and a half thousand, six thousand, seven thousand years ago, were domesticating a wild form of maize. And maize is a grass, uh, just like, it's just another grass. And they could not find the wild parent. And eventually, they did lots of trials and tests. They tried to force maize to mutate, to demonstrate that it had evolved out of a now extinct uh, parent. And eventually, a very smart guy looked at another crop that was growing widely in, in Latin America, actually all over the world, called Tiacente. And Tiacente is another grass, and actually it's grown as a fodder crop. And back in the day, when maize was de being domesticated, those farms, those settlements, were also growing Tiacente as a crop to feed their animals. And what's interesting is that Tiacente has various triggers in it when it mutates. And this guy worked out that within a very short period of time and within three or four particular mutations happening to Tiacente, you get maize. And so what we learned from that was that this is the thing, this is why I sit at the feet of these farmers, is they observe. They were looking for things that were different in the field. And that actually is what plant breeders do to this day. It's more than anything, it's about observation and curiosity. What happens if we, I take that and I save that seed and I grow it? And what happens next year? Is something going to change? And that's what these farmers did in this one valley. The Bala Valley in southwest, that's a valley in southwest Mexico. That is where maize was domesticated. And it happened very fast. Literally, within a couple of human generations, you went from a grass to the probably the most diverse crop in the world. It's also the most important uh, food crop in the world. It feeds, I think, 40% of the world get most of their carbohydrate from maize in some form or another today. So I was always really, I've always been fascinated by maize and how it fits into food culture. And in 2018, I was in America and actually I was doing some research for this book. And I was, I have a particular type of maize that I grow in my garden called Hopi Blue Maize. And, but it was, a, it was, it was some seed that I got from the Seed Savers Exchange in America. And it was a form of blue maize that grew with irrigation. And actually, I was really interested to understand and learn about how you grow maize when there is no water. And I found myself in the Hopi Nation. I was traveling across, uh, across the desert and I had been advised, look at them, the Hopi are a very private people, understandably. They've been victims of, you know, if, if they weren't being murdered by fellow Native Americans, they were being slaughtered by first the Spanish and then the rest of the Europeans who pitched up afterwards. So they are rather cautious and they, the Hopi Nation sits within the Navajo Nation who used to be their enemies. And they, they live in this amazing part of the Arizona desert, which is just like something straight out of a, a, you know, a cowboy farm. There's mesas and just wonderful. But I was told, look, you're never going to be able to talk to a Hopi farmer. They're very private. You can't go into the Hopi Nation, you can't take any photographs, you can't video anything, you can't record anything, you can't paint anything, um, but you can write stuff down. And I was told by a guy, look, there's a, there's a bloke who sells souvenirs to tourists on the second mesa in the Hopi Nation. And I don't know, sometimes they have a few seeds that they, they sell to tourists. And I, I drove up onto the second mesa, and there's this hot as hell and dusty, and there's this shack, 
with a sort of fly screen flapping in the wind and a clapped out old F-150 Ford pickup truck outside. And I walked in and there was a, it's a small place and hanging on the walls was sort of the hoping ephemera. So there were clothes and rugs and jewelry and stuff to sell to people passing through. And there were these two guys leaning on the counter. And one was a Hopi who was a giant of a man. And the other was this diminutive little white guy. And they were leaning on the counter and they were reading an article in Scientific American uh, about how Tiacente became maize. And in fact, it was a paper that I had been using as part of my research. I mean, I, so there was a very easy opening to the conversation. I couldn't believe it. I walked in and I saw them and I told them why I was there. And in the background, there was all this noises off and it was in the kitchen and somebody was busy baking. You could hear the clattering of pans. And um, so the white guy, who was from Kansas, had married a Hopi called Janice. And Hopi is a matriarchal society. The women own the land. They make all the decisions about what crops are going to be grown. And Janice had wanted to come back to live in the Hopi nation and be re reunited with her land. And part of the deal that the elders said is you can come back, but you have to farm traditionally. Fine. And he shouted, Janice, there's this English guy here. He's after some of your corn. And I kind of thought, oh, this is not a good way to try and win over a Hopi farmer. And Janice came out and she had, a, she had a bib on and she was covered in flour and her hands were covered in flour. And she looked me up and down and uh, I, and I took, talked, said to introduce myself and I told her why I was there and why I was so interested in how they were growing their maize and she explained to me how they grow it, which is completely different to how you would see maize growing in the fields here. They, they take a handful of seeds. They dig a, with a stick a hole a foot or more deep, they throw a handful of seeds in, they walk five paces and they do it again, and again, and again, and again. And so their seed has become incredibly well adapted to growing in these hyper-arid regions because there's just enough moisture that deep down for them to germinate. And then they send down deep tap roots to access their water and nutrients. And you end up with this small plant, it's not very high, these long leaves and they hang down in clumps and like the shading the ground so they create this little microclimate and then you get this incredible blue corn and she looked at me and she said sure I'll give you some of my corn and she went back out into the kitchen and she gave me a little bag of her blue maize she also said I'll give you some of my white tipari beans Hopi white tipari beans and again that's a bean that grows in a hyper-arid region, it never, doesn't never need irrigation. When I grow them, I chuck them in the polytunnel and I just ignore them for six months. I let them grow, I don't water them, I don't do anything with them. And then I harvest this little small, very high protein, interesting bean. I wouldn't say it was, it's not my favorite, but it's. And one of the things about, and I write about this, is about what's so remarkable about the Hopi, is that they, Every farm has its own blue maize. And if you are a young, lovesick Hopi who wants to win the heart of that young lady at the farm next door, she's only going to marry you if your maize cuts it. And that's absolutely true. So you are judged by how good your maize is. Because the last thing a Hopi wants is some third rate maize growing on their farm because the lovesick bloke won her over and he's brought this rubbish with him. And so you have in this nation, they used to have, I think, I don't know, I think back in the 50s, botanists were looking at the diversity of maize there, 40, 50 land races, now maybe there's two dozen, but there's still two dozen. This visceral relationship that these people have with their food and how important it is. And I talked to a, 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 a Hopi elder. He was not in the Hopi nation. I met him in New Mexico outside Santa Fe. And he was growing blue maize. And he, I said, 
why do you grow it? What's, what's so great about it? He said, I eat it every day. It's good medicine. He, he eats it as a sort of sloppy porridge. Again, not my idea of perfect breakfast. <laughs> uh, but when I grew it, I thought, I'll grow it in a polytunnel. I'll do, treat it like it's exactly like I would if it was growing on the second mesa in Arizona. And so, but I didn't plant it in a big single hole. I planted a small little square of, I don't know, a dozen or so plants, and I just left them. And that's what it kind of looks like. Nothing very attractive. But when you let the cobs dry on the plant, that's what you end up with. And I really wanted to grow it because I really fancied making blue polenta. And I needed a corn mill. In the middle of nowhere in Arizona, I went to um, a trading station, which again was a bit like you're in a cowboy film with a hitch, rail hitch, you know, and somebody with a horse and various, and walked into this place and asked, uh, it was a Navajo uh, uh, um, Indian who I asked about them, and he looked me up and down, and he said, yeah, sure, sure, we've got these things, and he disappeared or somewhere, and he came out with one of those things that you could screw onto the table and turn the handle and grind your corn. And where do you think? That corn mill came from China. <laughs> uh, I, I hope I've got enough time. I just, I just want to tell you about another a plant that I write about, which symbolizes the globalization of food and how globalization is nothing new. Actually, the story of globalization is the story of our diet and how it's traveled around the world. I was in Myanmar, I've been in Myanmar a few times because it's was a country that, again, had huge genetic diversity. Most of the people live on the land. The average farm size is about two and a half acres. And everybody is growing and saving their own seeds. And you have this incredible climate range uh, from in the north, you're in the foothills of the Himalayas, in the south, you're down in the tropics. And I was in Shan State, uh, which at the time, there was, they, were, they were very independently minded people. Um, and uh, it was, it's always been a very tense place and, but now of course there's a full on war going on in Shan and the Shan are giving those shits who, uh, the, the junta who run the place at the moment, a, a, a thoroughly good thrashing and I think it's really interesting the leadership they're providing to rail against the hegemony of, of the brutality of that regime. But I was there and I do the thing that I do whenever I travel. First place I go is the market. And I walked into the market in this little town called Sipol, which is on the road to Mandalay from China. And you'd see these big trucks going through, piled high with watermelons and pineapples and hybrid corn, which the Chinese were getting the, the, the local farmers to start to grow, to export to China. And this is the, where this existential danger exists for these incredible diversity of crops that these farmers have been growing and maintaining for generations is that as soon as they stop growing them within a year it's gone and once you lose that particular crop variety land race you lose its genetics you lose all the things that it has that actually are part of how we can build a world and live in a world where we can survive when the climate changes is our vibe when we're not killing each other. And there in the market were a number of women who were selling these big, these baskets, piled high with these beans. And six o'clock in the morning, people are coming in, they want a snack, and they buy a handful, and they pop them out of their shells, a bit like we would with an edamame bean. And it's a, quite a big bean, and um, quite colorful. Um, and I was really interested in it, and I had a wonderful guide, who was a Shan, and I asked him, and so I said, so tell me about this bean, because I kind of had a suspicion of what I thought it was, and he said, oh, well, this is a Shan bean, and we call it the angry bean, and we call it the angry bean, because if a pregnant woman tries to harvest this bean, it will stop cropping, and that, again, is just tell, told me instantly that this bean is completely embedded into Shan culture. This bean does not come from Shan. This bean 
comes from Peru, but that's another story. And uh, as you can see, it's a strange looking creature. And I was, I was very keen to get my hands on some of them. And fortunately, Aung So's mum had a few beans because I was there at the time of year when they're harvesting. They didn't have dried beans. And uh, I said, oh, look, I don't want to take your beans. You know, you need to grow them next year. And she said, oh, it's okay, Adam, don't worry. We're actually putting a new bungalow into the garden for the tourists. Um, so I'm not going to grow them anymore. And that is a story. Anyway, I brought these beans back home and I tweeted about them because I really wasn't sure what their provenance was. And I got a message back from a, a woman in Slovenia who said, Adam, I know what these are because a woman who lives in my village, her son has emigrated to America and she went to see him in Texas and she brought some of these beans back home with her and she grows them and sells them in the market in our village. This bean, I then did some research and I hooked up with a guy in Texas and we compared notes about my beans and his beans and we absolutely they are basically land races of the same variety, which is a, a particular, it's a lima bean, Fasolus lunatus, subspecies Pala, very, very closely related to the runner bean, but a different species. And I took those beans back home with me, and I thought, well, I'll see how they grow. And I put them in a greenhouse, just to be sure, and that's what happened. <laughs> they liked it. And I got a one hell of a crop. And it is, in America, it was an important food crop, particularly in the middle of the 19th century, where it was known as the Christmas lima bean in America. And why was it called the Christmas lima bean? Because during the gold rush, prospectors moving to California, they needed something to eat in lean times in the winter. And there was a trade running up and down the west coast of, of America. There's lots of whaling going on and trade and stuff. And so you've got a ship and you've got a crew, you've got to feed them. You're coming in from the south, from Peru, further south even than that, you fill it up with beans. And that's how this particular bean found its way into America and became a part of the story of American food culture. Because in the middle of winter, you needed a protein, you needed nutrition, that was what you grew. It's called the Christmas lima bean because you ate it at Christmas time. And actually it comes from a particular region of, of the um, west side of the Andes in, in Peru. Uh, because there's another lima bean the Siva bean, which is white, which is on the other side of the Andes. But this lima bean, lima bean, when you look at pre-Inca pottery that's three and a half thousand years old, it's decorated with... Have I gone? I didn't mean to do that. I'll skim through because you need to see this picture. That's what it looks like. It's an absolutely spectacular bean, and it tastes like a chestnut. And you can eat it fresh out of the pot, or you can dry it, and uh, soak it and eat it like you would any other dried bean. It has a problem here, is that it, it's not entirely in love with the British climate. But I'm working again on adapting by selecting from beans to try and select beans that will grow outside here in a good summer, I have managed it at a couple of times, and I should have grown last year and I didn't, uh, but I will grow this year. And that just tells you how something as simple as this can mean so much in such different ways to people from across the world, and yet it's been part of a food culture for literally millennia. So that just gives you a flavor, I hope, of what I was doing. Uh, and um, that's my brief story. I did have another picture I was going to show you because I'm a complete tart. So I brought a few copies of my book with me. Um, that if you wanted a copy, I would gladly sell you one. I have them in paperback here. Um, and if you want a copy, I've got a few there and I'll happily take your money off you. It's £10 a pot, which is a lot less than the cover price. Um, 
And if you've got any questions, I'm really happy to answer. You've gone quiet. <laughs> I've had this, I've, heard, I've found this before with other crops. It's classic, so to put it's country, it's, they, they also, animism is was also a part of their early culture. And it's, it, it chunk animists, so they believe in animists, so, you know, they, they, you know, the spirit world is, okay. you know, everything's alive, you know, the trees have spirits, the animals have spirits. But it's, you know, this is something that we see a lot of, you know, the unclean, Woman, the menstruating woman. The, so, it, in, you know, we've had this in, in in other monotheistic religions, the same. So it's something that's actually not that unusual. That unbelievable. Yeah, and it's just some. I mean, it's it, it's 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 the classic. As I say, I've 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 come across it with other with other crops. I, I, with lots of different actually with 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 with, with chilies in Africa. Weird yeah. things like that. They won't let the women harvest them because they think it's bad luck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Listen out, aren't they? Sorry. Listen They are. Well, that's, <laughs> what can I say? Uh, the Hopi aren't that stupid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, thanks for your talk. Um, with, you, yeah. you, you described. Oh, sure. Um, yeah, you described a few of the varieties you found yeah. as being incredibly delicious. I just wondered if you noticed any difference when you came back and grew them in, in the UK climate, if, if they retain those, it, those It's a very, very good question. So there are certain crops that really, their organoleptic qualities are really driven by um, light and temperature. Tomato is a really good example of that. You know, you go and eat a beautiful tomato, in southern Italy, you bring the seed home, you grow it, and it's slightly disappointing. And that's because a number of crops, particularly with, when you have these complex sugars in them, strawberries are another good example, um, you know, they need lots of sun and lots of heat, and then you, you, you get the, the flavours. But actually, for most crops, it's not the case. And again, if one is selecting for uh, the things that are really working. So, for example, I select for earliness capsicum. So, with my, that that pepper, I think is is as delicious. It's been consistently delicious. But because I've been growing it for thirty odd years, and I've probably got twenty accessions. I've grown it at least twenty different times, from twenty different generations of seed. And I'm selecting seed that's the, from the first fruits, the largest fruits. That mature, and that means I can now grow this crop outside in the UK. And it fruits the first, it's the absolutely the first capsicum that I harvest, um, except for one called Pubesens ricotto, the ricotto chili, which is a perennial chili, which is currently in flower and setting fruit as I speak. But that's a very hardy, interesting chili. That's a definitely worth growing. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. It's not my computer. Can I just ask another question? Oh, have you got a, a, a current program? I mean, what's your current uh, um, uh, exploration? What am I up to at the moment? I'm off to Ethiopia next month um, for a couple of weeks into the southern Rift Valley, which is. Um, be, I'm, I've got an, I'm working on a new book, which will be published this time next year, which is about the future of plant breeding. It's about what do we do, how should we really be thinking about how we develop crops that are going to feed us, but that are sustainable, that conserve biodiversity, um, and in this rapidly changing climate. And so, that there are lots. There's a whole suite of approaches, and 
One of the most important of these is uh, the maintenance and development of um, evolutionary plant breeding, which is really built around land races, farmer varieties. So that's one of the reasons why I'm in Ethiopia, is because you have, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a crop called NSET, it's actually a perennial, it's a f member of the banana family, and NSET provides all of the carbohydrate for 70 million people in Ethiopia. And it's an indigenous plant, and it is amazing how they grow it, and what they, the, the knowledge that these people have about how they are selecting in order to be able to keep, have, have a, have, to be able to feed themselves, to have resilience in their food system. Um, and this applies across the board. So you have farmer varieties and what, well, this evolutionary approach to plant breeding. And then you have really interesting things that are happening with, particularly with cereals. So population, populations of cereals. And there's, a, there's great things happening in this country. You just go down the road and you can buy population wheat and great bread in Bridgewater, you've got it here in, 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 in Bristol, and this is with farmers growing, instead of just having one monoculture in their field, they will have 20 or 40 different varieties of wheat growing in the same field. And this is something that we are finally starting to learn from these indigenous farmers who knew that if you choose, grew just one type of plant and something happened, it was either too wet or it was too dry, or they had an invasion of locusts one year, that actually this was a disaster. And this is the, this is the real problem that we have with homogeneity in our food system, is we become, it becomes incredibly fragile. So I'm looking at what can we learn from indigenous farmers, but also what's happening around the world with freelance plant breeding, with open source plant breeding, but also with genetics. So it's about what, what does the application of a scientific and systematic approach to plant breeding, what does it also bring to the table, which can run counter to the hegemony of foods as a commodity. So that's really where I'm working at the moment. Buy the book next year. <laughs>